very much. Um, again, I want to thank you and, and, and Jorge for inviting me. I had a, a good time yesterday and um, uh, I'll continue the discussion today, but I'll focus it more uh, on uh, the post Keynes, you know, the heterodox uh, perspective. So just to summarize yesterday, I, I, I discussed the, um, the main model of monetary policy, uh, which is inflation targeting uh, or new consensus model. And one question that I'm having with some colleagues is whether this model is still appropriate. And I think it is. I think, it, you know, uh, some countries are moving towards dual mandates, but the original inflation targeting uh, model uh, accounted for that in terms of the different weights to assign to output gaps and to inflation gaps. And even though uh, some central banks are moving towards dual mandates or flexible inflation targeting, the basic assumptions of the model that changes in interest rates will have an impact through your IS curve or through your Phillips curve remains intact. Um, inflation is still seen as the domain of central banks. Um, you know, inflate, and, and the fight against inflation is seen as a public good, right? I mean, central banks fight inflation in the name of everyone. And it's assumed that as inflation comes down as a result of monetary policy, everybody gains from that. Uh, the per what I want to deal today, uh, discuss today in a little bit more uh, details is that there are winners and losers and that um, the idea of monetary policy has to go beyond just this mechanical um, description of Taylor rules. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've been working a lot with uh, two colleagues, uh, Guillaume Vallet uh, in France and Wesley Marshall uh, from Mexico on sort of re-examining uh, central banking and monetary policy, taking it out of a sort of a narrow approach to it and sort of putting it back into um, a vision of society as a whole. Um, and, you know, I've used the expression central banking at the intersection uh, of society. And, and this is precisely how, how we have to see central banks moving forward. So whereas the story by neoclassical economists is very sort of narrow, you raise interest rate, it lowers output and lowers inflation. What I want to do is sort of peel uh, the layers off and kind of look at uh, what's happening underneath, sort of a disaggregated approach. And what we're going to find out is that, uh, and this is sort of the reconstruction of uh, monetary policy along heterodox uh, grounds is that what we're gonna see is that monetary policy has to be seen in a different light. And that income distribution is at the heart of, of uh, monetary policy. And once you do that, it opens up the discussion to a lot of things. As soon as you talk about social classes, you talk about power, you talk about social reset, social uh, relationships, you talk about conflict. And this is the point that I'm gonna to make today is that monetary policy is rooted in conflict. And uh, in order to have a proper understanding of that, uh, we might have to go a little bit beyond pure economics. So we might have to deal with you know, sociology. We might have to deal with uh, psychology. Uh, we might have to deal with other sort of uh, disciplines. And this is very in the spirit of Keynes. Remember that famous quote by Keynes where he says, the economist has to be a bit mathematician, a bit economist, a bit philosopher, a bit sociologist. And this is exactly what uh, I'm trying to do with my colleagues 
um, to sort of um, impose that Keynes definition on the study of central banks. So we, not, we need to go beyond economics and bring in sort of other arguments. One paper that I'm currently working on with uh, Guillaume Vallet is what we call the cult of the central banker, for example. Why is it that the central banker insists all the time in wanting to fight inflation? These are intelligent people and surely they can see the data. Uh, they can see that maybe the model is, is, is perhaps weak. Um, so why do they keep insisting on that? Um, so we're working on this paper and you know, what we're arguing is that, you know, these central bankers cannot lose credibility because the post central bank position will surely entail uh, positions on corporate boards of, of corporate America and um, which represents millions and millions of revenues for them. So if they start spewing things like, oh, maybe central banks are not able to fight inflation, maybe this and that, um, I think they're gonna lose credibility and they won't be able to, to benefit. If you wanna be a neoclassical economist, think of, it, think of it in terms of a utility function, a central banker utility function. Um, but anyways, okay, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, um, so, you know, in contrast to yesterday where I was arguing uh, about the deconstruction, here we're talking about the reconstruction or the rebuilding of monetary policy. Um, just a couple of plugins, uh, why not, since I have the floor. Um, a lot of these activities that I've been doing um, are part of this institute, the Monetary Policy Institute uh, that uh, I've created uh, with uh, a young Brazilian called Silvio Capes and Guillaume Vallée from France. And, um, you know, in the last year, we came out with about 10 or 11 edited books. I showed you the first five books of the series on central banking with Elgar, but um, there are a couple of other books. And we're currently working now on a book on dollarization with the former presidential candidate uh, of Ecuador who did his PhD at UNAM. You, you might know him, you must know him. And we're, we're doing a book on monetary policy implementation and also, um, ah, well, I thought I had the slide, the other slide came, but one of the activities that we're doing right now, which is sort of the discussion that, that we're doing today is this, um, is this conference in September. And, you know, most of these people on your right, except for a few are all uh, students, uh, graduate students. And it's sort of a workshop uh, and a way for these graduate students to, uh, to expand the research. Ah, so two of the books that we're currently working on for this new series is Central Banking, Monetary Policy and Gender. And now there are only a few papers, Elissa Brownstein, for example, and a few others who look at the gendered aspects of monetary policy. Um, to my knowledge, there are no books on the topic. There are no symposiums and journals on the topic. So this will really be sort of the first book on uh, this topic. And I'm hoping that it will serve as an anchor um, to future research. Um, and the other book that we're working on, uh, that I'm currently working on, and I haven't contacted ever, it's very preliminary. And uh, Noemi Levy will be invited for sure. Um, is central banking, monetary policy, and financial stability? And one of the one, one of the arguments that I've, I've always sort of defended was the notion that financial asset bubbles are not caused by low interest rates. This is sort of the cheap neoclassical version of the story, and a way to blame monetary policy or irresponsible low interest rates on on asset bubbles. Rather. 
acid bubbles are caused by the lack of, of regulations. Um, so uh, the fact that banks, the fact that different financial actors can do literally whatever they want in a speculative uh, 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 approach to their uh, wealth, um, this is really what is, uh, you know, uh, encouraging these asset bubbles. So, uh, because one of the things that I've always sort of been advocating is for a permanent uh, low interest rate policy for reasons that I will explore. And once you have that low interest rate policy, you can then have um, a number of regulations that will, um, that will well, regulate um, financial markets and financial actions and, and et cetera. And you know, these are arguments that are not um, unknown to post-Keynesians. So in addition to these two books, there are uh, three books coming out. Um, one is A Brief History of Economic Thought. I'm very proud of this book. I uh, edited it with Hassan Bougrin. Uh, my longtime uh, collaborator, co-author Sergio Rossi and I are coming out with Encyclopedia of post and Economics. And I think, Noemi, you have something in there. And a book that just came out on Kieletsky uh, to celebrate the 50 years since his... Uh, since his passing. Okay, that's it for the self-promotion. So yesterday I was talking about these two words that summarize neoclassical theory. And I said, you know, it's convergence and stability. These are fair weather models that as soon as you have some sort of uh, movement away from equilibrium, which is by definition a shock, right? Because of the system is rooted in convergence and stability, there is no reason to leave the equilibrium position unless you have some sort of shock on the system. And the shock could be, you know, fiscal policy, et cetera. Uh, and then I argue, you know, for post-Keynesians, um, I'm not convinced that shocks, economic shocks exist. I think that, you know, everything is sort of endogenous to to our actions, to our policies. And, um, and because of this, it brings in issues of instability and fragility. Now, so these are Minsky words. And I think it's sort of, the, it's certainly the correct way of seeing um, our economies. They're fragile, they're prone to periods of instability. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in, in Minsky's words, stability breeds instability and that cycles are endogenous, crises are endogenous. Um, and I would, you know, even argue that environmental uh, concerns are completely endogenous. Um, so, uh, so this is a way that I would describe post Keynes and economic fragility and instability. With respect to uh, monetary policy in particular, um, I really would like to encourage uh, students, young scholars, to go beyond endogenous money. As editor of a journal, I'm not interested in papers that prove that money's endogenous. I get these all the time. You know, the endogeneity, the endogeneity, the endogeneity of money, you know, in Mexico or in Chile. I think this is sort of a moot argument now. Uh, and as post Keynesians, we have to go way beyond that. Uh, and the same thing with papers on the structuralism and horizontalism debates. Uh, we have to go beyond that. I think that's a, uh, I was thinking of, uh, but anyways, it's a discussion that I think we have thoroughly had and, and we have to go beyond that even if it's just because we're all horizontalists now. But, uh, but we have to go beyond that and we have to turn our attention to, to policy. I think there's too much research on monetary theory and I'm guilty of that as well, but we need to go beyond policy. Uh, we need to go beyond that and deal with policy. And we have to have able to say something 
uh, Jamie Galbraith wrote a paper, published a paper uh, this year or in 2021, where he argued uh, that economics is about having something to say about the world and how to deal with it. Um, so, and I think on the whole, post Keynesians are not bad at it, although we have gotten bogged down in a lot of, and I know I'm gonna make enemies here, but in, in methodology and history of thought, says the guy who's coming out with a book on it. Um, but I think that we have to really sort of move and deal with policy and we have a lot to say about it. How about the war in Ukraine? How about the, you know, the impact on oil? Will that lead to a spike in the price of oil? Will that lead to stagflation? Will we, you know, we have to be able to, to have, and what is the response the central bank should have or fiscal policy? So we have to have something to say about that. Um, as I said yesterday, monetary is a blunt instrument. You know, I've often described it as sort of a, uh, oh, what do we say? Uh, uh, a big, huge hammer. And if you're trying to kill the fly on your table, boom, you're going to kill your fly, but you're going to kill your table as well. So, you know, the only thing monetary policy can do is raise interest rates five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times. And eventually, as Keynes tells us, you, you're going to kill the patient. You're going to cure the disease, you're going to kill the fly but you're gonna kill the table. So I think that there is sort of a way of um, trying to understand what monetary policy really is. And I talked about that black box yesterday. Um, we have to be able to open up and examine the black box and sort of figure out uh, what monetary policy is and what it does. And I think that the first, uh, first step we need to take is to reject fine tuning. Uh, there are quite a few post Keynesians who are in favor of fine tuning, as I mentioned, uh, Pally and uh, Fontana and others. And I think that the arguments that I presented yesterday against the transmission mechanism of fine tuning apply to the post Keynesian uh, uh, approach as well. Uh, if you simply uh, replace the target, the monetary target with the real target, uh, you still have to have that transmission mechanism that somehow affects unemployment or growth. And what does that rely on? You're going to discover that it relies very much on sort of the same arguments. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, does this mean that monetary policy is irrelevant? And I want to be clear on this. The answer is no, it's not irrelevant. It does have a place. Of course, it has, it has a place to play, it has a role to play uh, in a monetary economy. But what is that role precisely? And uh, this is what um, I want to explore today. Um, and I want to be clear that one thing that uh, needs to be sort of a little bit, uh, um, you know, set, uh, concerned about is that a lot of post Keynesians talk about <coughs> the impact of interest rates on the economy. And what we really have to talk about is the two things, the impact of incremental changes in interest rates, which is different from the impact of interest rates. So, um, and you know, they mash up at one time, at one point or another. If you increase your rate from 0.25 to 0.50, like in Canada, we did a couple of weeks ago, I don't think that has, that's going to have any impact at all. If you increase the 0.75 to 0.1, I don't think so. So I don't think these, the economy responds to these incremental changes. And for the record, I don't even think uh, real estate uh, markets react to these incremental changes. What happens that 
the economy will eventually react by if you push the interest rate high. And so uh, I've called this, as I mentioned yesterday, the pursuit of the Holy Grail, which is a neutral rate. And it's a very odd term because there's nothing neutral about it. The pursuit of neutral rates will most probably collapse the economy. So nothing neutral about it. And that brings up you know, discussions about what does your investment function depend on? If not on interest rates, then what on? And I'm not gonna discuss that today, um, maybe the subject of another talk. And so I mentioned this yesterday about the asymmetric nature of interest rates. Um, here's a couple of uh, quote, Mark Lavois, always my go-to uh, economist. Um, this is not to say the central banks have no power. They can certainly induce a recession by raising nominal and real interest rates so high that it eventually collapses the economy. In my view, however, as it has been verified since 2008, this power is asymmetric. Asymmetric. Central banks have much less ability to kickstart the economy. And, you know, serve a storm, always a delight to read. Uh, if memory serves me, I think this was an INET um, posting on, on the internet. Um, so there you go. I mean, these are sort of old arguments that the that, that post Keynes have made. Um, so for me, what that means is that monetary policy cannot be used on its own. So I reject this concept of monetary policy uh, dominance. Now, for the record, if you Google monetary policy dominance, you're not going to find anything. You're going to find a lot of stuff on fiscal policy dominance, a lot of very critical stuff on fiscal policy, but very little. It's, it's as if the mainstream has not considered the concept of monetary policy dominance and what that means and what that entails. Um, but uh, we certainly need to talk about it um, and the proper role of the central bank in, rec in recognizing uh, the world in which we live. So um, we have to rethink, we have to rebuild, we have to reimagine monetary policy. And I hope to be contributing to that this morning. And where do we begin? Well, we begin by acknowledging that the rate of interest, first of all, of course, you know, following Keynes, uh, the central bank can have any interest rate it wants, uh, any nominal rate, and I also believe any real rate that it wants. Uh, but that decision may carry implications on exchange rates, on whatever, on capital flight, but you know the central bank, the mechanism or the implementation of interest rate, I think is completely um, bureaucratic, and um, but it can have, of course, implications. But in setting the interest rate, the interest rate itself, we have to recognize that it's not only a cost, the cost of lending, the cost of borrowing, which is traditionally how neoclassical theory sees interest rates. But we also have to recognize that it's a revenue. It's a revenue for those who hold interest-bearing assets, government bonds, for example, and other, uh, and, and other securities. So it represents a revenue as well. Um, and so that opens up the door to a whole kind of discussion um, that the mainstream is starting to have, and I'm going to have to, I'm going to say something a little bit about that uh, later on in this presentation, but uh, it's very different discussion than what post Keynesians are having. So, like I said, for whom it's a revenue for bondholders, uh, interest bearing asset holders, and this plays in right into what John Smith and have been arguing since 1996. It's you know monetary policy or increasing interest rates must be seen, uh, seen as the revenge of the rentier and that it's rooted in social classes. It's rooted in conflict. There are winners and there are losers uh, if interest rates increase. And this is why the central bank focuses 
its policy on inflation. If it does succeed in bringing down inflation, they argue this is a public good, everybody wins from it. But if you look at um, the side of the equation where interest is a revenue, you're gonna see that as that interest rate increases, some people are benefiting and some people are not. And so if you look at the rent share, if you look at the argument in terms of shares, the rent share will increase and necessarily the wage share will decrease, uh, ceteris paribus. So um, you're bringing in issues of income distribution. Um, and there are you know, a lot of ways of looking at how um, that affects uh, distribution. Um, certainly, um, as interest rates increases, it benefits bondholders, rentiers. As it, uh, interest rates come down, it benefits debt payments, which is usually debt holders, or workers. And, you know, Stiglitz has argued that low interest rates will tend to increase inequality because it gives privileged people access to credit. And so uh, they have more credit, they can build on that. And inequality builds on itself, he says, because of access to credit. And there's you know, some people who are working, some heterodox people working on that aspect of monetary policy as well. So it's clear that it's got different effects and we're gonna see some other effects in a few moments, but uh, you know what we need to be able to do is look at the net effects of all of that. And in my opinion, though again, it's an empirical question, um, I would argue that higher rates will tend to benefit um, interest-bearing asset holders. Okay. Now, the idea of linking together monetary policy and income distribution goes back quite a long time in post-Keynesians uh, history. For example, Keynes, of course, the euthanasia of the wrench here in the last chapter of the general theory. You know, Keynes recognizes that in the long run, if you set interest rates closer to zero, that you can, you can effectively euthanize the rentier class, right? And that euthanasia of the rentier is, is sort of a cornerstone of a lot of post-Keynesian uh, analysis. But more recently, Chris Nigel published this wonderful paper, I think that's in the Journal of Economic uh, Issues, 1989, where you know he argues here that changes in interest rates can affect the functional distribution of income and thus the personal uh, distribution. Changes in interest rates um, change the market values of financial assets, affecting capital gains or losses and interest rates influence investment, aggregate demand, employment and income. So sort of a labor market impact here, which relies you know, on this IS curve and Phillips curve. So I put less emphasis on that, especially when we talk about incremental changes. But Chris Nickel, uh, Basil, my good friend Basil Moore, 1989, Basil's approach was very interesting because he says that changes in, in interest rates um, impact markup of firms, uh, costs, interest rates are costs and firms may want to raise the markup to recover those costs and that's going to affect uh, the distribution. Um, so, you know, the distribution, functional distribution uh, depends on changes in interest rates that centers directly on the responsiveness of the markup to interest rates. A very sort of interesting way. And I started writing a paper uh, on that, trying to analyze this a little bit more. I think there's definitely um, research to be done. If anyone out there is interested in uh, writing a paper with me on this topic. I think there's something there that we need to explore. Excuse me. Now, Tom Mitchell, 1991. Um, 
you know, he talks about interest on the national debt redistributes income regressively, uh, regressively away from workers. Um, the high concentration of interest paid directly to households, but it's the 10% of households that receive 75% of the, of the interest and the top 1% receive 40%. So this is sort of very much uh, in the tradition of seeing the re rate of interest as a revenue. Arrestus and, and Howell, uh, Philip uh, writes, uh, it's, you know, the profession hasn't given a lot of attention to this. And he's absolutely right. There are, you know, post Keynesians you have work, I've just given you some quotes, but the work of Marc Lavoie and Marius Ekerechia on this, um, they have done excellent work uh, along, very much inspired by the work of Pazinetti. I've presented at UNAM before the invitation of, uh, of, of, of both Noemi and Jorge, I believe, uh, what's called the Pazinetti Index, which measures sort of the distribution of income <clears throat> from the perspective of monetary policy. I'm not gonna do that today. Um, but, you know, to show that there are, um, there is a history, again, uh, um, Agaitis and Patelis, I think George Agaitis, <clears throat> um, argues little attention has been paid again, again, we, we know this, but here they go on to describe, again, the importance of interest rates of monetary policy in the discussion of income distribution. Now, this is a graph figure from a paper with Mario Sigareccia published in the Argentinian Central Bank uh, Journal, which is coming out in English in a book on monetary policy and income distribution that I'm editing. So this is the black box, right? Um, and I guess we there's a lot to sort of add to that black box and it would be interesting sort of to develop it. But essentially changes in the interest rate uh, is divided between sort of the income channel and that income channel will be divided in the direct mechanism. So this is the rate of interest as an income for financial holders. And the indirect effect, which is the rate of interest may influence labor markets at unemployment. And combined, these will have an impact on income distribution and aggregate demand. So yeah, sure, changes in, uh, changes in monetary policy will have an impact on aggregate demand, but through this mechanism, okay? Um, and it also has a wealth channel, which is the relationship with monetary policy uh, and asset bubbles in the absence of prop proper rate regulations. I'm talking financial markets, I'm talking uh, real estate values, um, and, uh, and this is sort of the black box. And, there's a lot to be sort of added here, details that need to be added, but it gives you, I think, a blueprint on what the post-Keynesian approach is. And so one of the things that uh, should be clear by now is that monetary policy is rooted in conflict and social classes, distribution of income and wealth, social classes. And I asked the question whether monetary policy is class biased. Now, I've got a paper coming out in a book edited by your colleague, Alicia Guillon, in which I talk about the inherent biases of monetary policy. And for me, um, yeah, monetary policy is class biased. That That is how we should interpret um, monetary policy. So instead of this mechanical, um, and I was reading John Taylor's article, original article where he proposes his, his, his Taylor rule. And he sort of like uses words like mechanical. I can't remember the other words, but they're all very, very much like that. And that's because I think they want to keep the focus on the economics of it. 
um, whereas I'm trying to shift the focus on the hmm, political economy or even the sociology of it um, by peeling away, like I said, uh, the layers. Um, so if there's one thing that we need to, 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 um, to take from this, is that monetary policy is income distribution. And uh, it's rooted in conflict at two levels. First, the decision to fight inflation itself is a class conscious uh, policy. Why fight inflation? Why describe inflation as this uh, great public good? Why not? Uh, choose to fight unemployment? Why not choose to, you know, some sort of real variable? Well, the choice to fight inflation, I think, is to protect precisely the wealth of those people in which you travel, central bankers travel. And central bankers often come from those circles as well. Like I mentioned yesterday, uh, you know, the Wall Street versus Main Street. So the, the case, the case, the decision to fight inflation is a class conscious decision. And second, the fact that that the way you, you protect inflation generates income distribution and conflict at that level as well. Has this changed with dual mandates or flexible inflation targeting mandates? I don't think so. I think that, you know, uh, and, and I've had these discussions with people and they go, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Central banks, you know, will think twice before raising interest rates. No, they won't. You know, uh, if you look, if you read the, the messages sent by Powell, you know, when he introduced dual mandate, you know, it was very nice and, you know, we have to think about employment and unemployment and stuff. But if you look at their actions, he, uh, the Federal Reserve, the Bank of Canada, they won't hesitate to raise uh, interest rates several times over the next couple of years. The Bank of Canada issued a statement, you know, two weeks ago when it said interest rates, uh, interest rates are their word on the path of, uh, of future increases, you know. Um, so I don't think that dual mandates will change anything. And so all of this, and this is my go-to quote. Uh, this is an article that Mark published in Money in Motion, edited by De La Place and Nell. And this, I think, is, this summarizes for me uh, the entirety of monetary policy from a post-Keynesian perspective. So I will read this quote in, in, in all its, uh, you know. It then becomes clear, given what I've discussed earlier, that monetary policy should not so much be designed to control the level of activity based on what I said yesterday, but rather to find the level of interest rates that will be proper for the economy from a distribution point of view. The aim of such a policy should be to minimize conflict over the income shares in the hope of simultaneously keeping inflation low and activity high. So he brings us, he brings in conflict, in, uh, uh, um, income distribution, uh, a rejection of fine tuning. And this is the paragraph that inspired me to write these three papers with Mark Setterfield those interest rate rules, this is where the inspiration came from. I think it's a very powerful chapter. Uh, if you can get your hands on it, maybe Money in Motion. I think Money in Motion is on uh, Library Genesis. Uh, you can get a copy there for free. Uh, there's like a, 30 amazing chapters in that, uh, Minsky and Basil and, uh, uh, you know, and more. Um, so, uh, so I recommend the book. But anyways, this is the um, quote that 
inspired me. And 1996, you know, um, I was uh, doing my PhD at the time. And uh, in fact, when I arrived at the new school in 93, I asked Edward Nell if I could work on a project. And he gave me this book to put together. So, you know, I read all of these chapters in the book and I remember vividly reading this chapter. And of course I was an undergraduate student of, of Marx. So I've been aware of these sort of arguments, but it was, it was really the first kind of, the kind of stuff I was aware with Mark was endogenous money. And this, I think, was one of the first times that I realized that we, we could, we needed to go beyond just sort of endogenous money. And this is sort of, um, it was a very pivotal uh, uh, reading in my career. Now, let's talk about the mainstream's approach. Since the financial crisis in 2007 or 2008, there has been a ton of articles on the relationship between monetary policy and income distribution. And I have literally hundreds of quotes, various quotes. And from what I I can argue is that first of all, the topic was largely ignored before the financial crisis. And I think that quantitative easing is what really sort of um, spurred the interest of the mainstream to this topic. Um, not so much interest rates, but really quantitative easing. I think it became very clear very early on that quantitative easing was having distributional, distributional uh, effects. And so, yeah, uh, the topic has been overlooked. There's a lot of papers that say that. Um, and one of the conclusions is, you know, this is a great uh, uh, topic, uh, a great article, but, you know, and there's several papers that say this. Yes, yes, monetary policy always produces distributional effects. And when I was reading sort of these, uh, these papers at the time, you know, I was really kind of at the first at first glance, I was very uh, uh, happy that the topic uh, was being considered. And then, you know, when you look through these papers, you realize they don't quote any post Keynesians, none whatsoever. Um, it's as if they had come up with that topic. But it was interesting. And I reached out to Ampudi and I re reached out to Olson and a couple of other people and uh, you know, silence or, um, you know, I guess it's not fun to be told that you're kind of stealing other people's research, uh, which is kind of what I was saying in a polite way. Um, and, uh, you know, I've invited them to sort of contribute to a book or something like that, and they have no interest. And they're quite happy with the thought that this is their topic. And for post-Keynesians, it represents a really sort of dangerous precedent because, and this is why I've been so much talking about this topic in the last five years or more, is because if we don't go back to this topic, um, the mainstream is going to define uh, the context and the conclusions of this debate. And the conclusions, which I will discuss in a few, a few slides, are not pretty. OK, um, so we really have to. And this is why the Monetary Policy Institute was created. It was really sort of to, to tackle on, to take on this discussion of income distribution. Um, and this is the conclusion of their research. They have to be, this is completely um, consistent with the long run neutrality of money. Sure, sure, monetary policy always produces income, uh, income distributive uh, effects, but they're short lived because in the long run, they can't matter. So, you know, it doesn't have an impact in a stable manner, right? Uh, they're modest. Um, they tend to be they tend to be small and short lived. Um, 
you know, there's sort of a, a dis, uh, they're, they're a side effect of good solid um, monetary policy. Uh, central banks must fight inflation. We must do so with interest rates. And sure, there's some income distributive uh, consequences, but they're small and they're short lived. So it's sort of like um, very painless, uh, some people, but otherwise painless. And, um, and this is their conclusion. And because this is their conclusion, listen to this, uh, you can ignore it. You can ignore income inequality if you want to set uh, interest rates. And you know, this is what these people are saying. It cannot be motivated to distribute to distributive effect as a goal. Uh, does not involve policies aimed at the distribution of, of wealth. And you know, if you can hear my dog barking, my dog is called Maynard. Um, but but that's the conclusion, and that's a complete opposite conclusion of what post Keynesians have to argue on the topic. Um, in fact, we would argue um, that if it does impose long-run consequences on the distribution of income, you know, you're talking about structural changes, right? Um, but you know, it is akin to some sort of a incomes policy. And if you look at the last 40 years, just from the perspective of monetary policy, you can see that interest rates have generated more of a, you know, a distribution towards the rentier class for most of those 40 years. So you're talking about a quasi permanent incomes policy against workers. Um, so this is increasingly how I see monetary policy. Um, and I haven't even, again, discussed the impact like yesterday, because that would be just another sort of, I would need a good hour to talk about quantitative easing. But Anne Pettifer wrote this great little book in 2017. And she goes, yeah, QE inflated the value of assets on, on the whole by the more affluent. As such, QE contributed to rising inequality and to the political and social instability associated with it. Again, the word instability, which is at the core of my definition. So it's not so cool, insta it's social instability. But, you know, instability, this is what post Keynesian theory is. And this is, you know, endogenous instability. And this was, you know, an interesting quote by Claudio Borio. Um, He's come out to say that central banks are facing an intellectual challenge. Facts on the ground are increasingly testing the long-standing analytical paradigms on which central banks can rely to inform their policies. A number of beliefs that underpin the prevailing analytical paradigm may complicate this task. And you know, to go back to the question that I had yesterday, uh, where do we go? to see this, I can't remember the exact question. Where, where do we have to go to, to, to find inspiration for post-Keynesian uh, or critical policies? And I said, go to the data, it's there. And this is what Claudio says, you know, uh, facts on the ground, that's the data, that's the events around you uh, are contradicting a lot of the firmly held beliefs. Uh, of you know fine tuning, IS curve, Phillips curve, natural rates, natural rates of interest, and so on and so on. Um, okay, well the question that remains is so what? My fear is that you know, like the crisis, um, you know, these these central bankers and these policy wonks have short memories and they'll forget, they'll forget this or they'll ignore it. They're very good at ignoring stuff, you know. Um, you know, and this, you know, they're very good at ignoring stuff. You know, they're so believe that interest rates have an impact on that IS curve. So, you know, they raise interest rates, they don't see it, 
anything happening. They're raising again. They don't see any, anything happening. And what they are thinking is, oh, well, you know, at one time we're going to, you know, hit the sweet spot and we're going to have the impact. The reality is that IS curve is undermined by uh, the facts on the ground. But they ignore that and they stick to their uh, to their paradigm. So I want to I want to change a little bit of gears because I mentioned about those layers you want I want to peel away, and um, this is part of the the book that I told you I was writing uh, I was editing on monetary policy and gender. And there's very few research on it, but there is a little bit. Um, this paper by Young, Bridget Young, very good. And she examines the impact of QE on uh, sort of the gendered impact of QE. Uh, Elisa and, 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 and Hines uh, have looked at uh, monetary policy. And this is, they've looked at it from the point of view of labor markets. Um, in the forthcoming book, there's um, two women who will be looking at the impact of monetary policy on exchange rates and, you know, through exchange rates on income distribution in, in Latin America. Um, so there's going to be quite a few very interesting uh, papers coming out in this book that will come and complement the very few existing papers on the topic. Uh, and, you know, Whereas central banks have embraced the research agenda on monetary policy and income distribution, the Bank of England held a conference. You know, everything is blurry because of COVID. Was it before COVID? I think it was before COVID, so a couple of years ago, on this topic in conjunction with the London School of Economics. And for the record, I asked to be invited and they said no, because they didn't understand what I was trying to say. So, you know, if you don't talk in terms of general equilibrium models, um, they claim they don't understand you, which I think is, you know, an admission that they're illiterate more than anything else, because come on, you can understand what I'm saying. So let me talk about carbon bias. Um, so in this paper that I'm published, I talked about these three inherent biases, class bias, gender bias, and carbon bias. And, um, and there's a lot of literature on this in the post-Keynesian, uh, increasingly, and very few in the mainstream, but I did find one. And I found one that said, oh yes, uh, you know, um, monetary policy can have an environmental uh, impact. But look at what they say. Uh, I'm sorry, no, this not not this one. Not it's the next quote. Um, so you know, a couple of people have argued about it. This is so. This paper I've argued, yeah, yeah, yeah. There is green QE can have an impact, but green QE is neutral in the long run. Not surprising. And so, if QE is new, green QE is neutral in the long run, then you don't have to do it. You completely absorb absorb, absorb, absorb uh, 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 you completely, you know, oh, that word yourself uh, about any responsibility about the environment, about distribution, uh, gender, racialized minorities. So this argument of long run neutrality is a very powerful way of saying, we don't have to do anything about it. We can stick to this mechanical sort of approach to monetary policy. And that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luis Philippe. I suppose we can start now a nice round of discussion. If yeah. I may, I want to pose one question. Yes. And then perhaps we can ask people if they want to pose the question or either you read it in the chat how they um, yeah, yeah. worded it. Well, my question is the following. I agree totally with you that interest rate is a distributional, non-neutral variable. This is, a, I, I, I cannot 
it's obvious, well, it's not obvious, but I completely agree with that. My question is then, interest rates have changed and have modified the bank structure. We know that central bank uh, can modify uh, central uh, commercial bank's balance sheet to uh, interest rate and diverse instruments. What do you reckon interest rate, what are the channels? Because if it's too, too low, the central bank wouldn't be able to modify commercial banks' uh, balance sheet and their, um, and their performance. I will leave it to that, my okay. question, and there are two questions. Yeah, let me answer your so, question because my memory is me Let me now, all now uh, tell the people who are going afterwards. Okay. Um, tenemos dos, dos preguntas, cuestiones, disculpen ustedes, soy pocha. Dos preguntas eh, de Francisco Amsler. Estamos pensando si ustedes quieren eh, que o bien el profesor lea lo que ustedes pusieron en el chat o hagan la pregunta en vivo. Por, eh, y tenemos una pregunta de Marcial Luna. Ustedes nos dicen por el chat si quieren hacerla o nada más se lee por el chat. Do doctora, nada más hay que decirles. Entonces, eh, por claro. favor, si quieren hacer la pregunta en vivo, levanten la mano y les damos la voz. If you want to make your, your question, uh, we can open your, uh, the mic for you, but uh, raise your hand, please. Okay? Go ahead, please, Philip. So re regarding your question, um, I'm always an advocate of low interest rates. Uh, this said, uh, can't you, can't we not see some sort of ways for central banks to regulate the activities of banks? I mean, you know, it can, it can, in my opinion, your question could be answered through some sort of regulations. Uh, on banks. This is this is certainly how I would answer it. Oh, I can't hear you at all. We can discuss this further. It's a very interesting question. Okay. Uh, well, you know, so for example, in this book I want to do on financial instability, uh, it goes to that precise uh, question and what I said at the beginning, I said, I'm a big believer in, um, in these uh, uh, regulations. Now, the question, the obvious question, the next question is, is that even possible? Uh, you know, can we have this intrusive central bank in a free market uh, capitalist economy? Oh, you know, that's another question. Okay, let me take the question of Francisco Amsler. Is, the, is he the next one? I can't hear you, uh, Dara. Yes, 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 but uh, Sorry. Maybe, maybe Francisco. Francisco, uh, okay. por favor. Please. So it's... the interest rate as a distributive variable is normally accepted amongst cross gains. Um... Francisco is going to make it. Uh, ah, okay, okay, good. Uh, les pido de favor que sean eh, cortos. Eh, porque hay varias gente que quieren intervenir. Adelante, Francisco, yeah. tienes la palabra. Ok, muchas gracias. Well, thank you very much, Professor Rochon, and to the organizers as well. Uh, I'm Francisco from Argentina, and, well, very glad to, to get to hear directly Professor Rochon, uh, although I also liked reading you. So my question is, um, I'm working on my thesis, and it's uh, very related to the Sraffian monetary theory of distribution, like Pivetti, Panico, and they suggest this direct relationship between the interest rate and the profit rate, uh, similar to uh, that I didn't know that in a Kalekian way of interest rate connecting with the markup, which I found interest. So I would like to know what do you think about this approach and how much compatible do you think it is with other uh, post keynesian approaches? Yeah. So I think that the, 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 there was a debate at one time on whether it's the rate of profit that influences the rate of interest or the other way around. Uh, I'm firmly on the side, uh, I think because I have to, uh, that it, the causality goes from rate of interest to rate of profit. Um, and on that matter, I think I, you know, I fully agree with someone like, uh, like Massimo, 
who is going to who's coming to Toronto, by the way, um, and and Kaolo. I think that there's a lot of uh, similarities here uh, between the post Keynesians or the Kaletkians, because um, I'm not a big fan of the word post Keynesians anymore. Um, but the Kaletkians and and the Shrafian and and you know this goes on a number of uh, of topics. There's a lot of rapprochement uh, uh, being done on the super multiplier, for example. Um, where a lot of uh, uh, Shrafians are bringing in uh, money and and embedding the multiplier. You know, I used to always tell um, Serrano in Brazil, going back 20 years, where's the money in your super multiplier model? And I think that uh, this is uh, sort of becoming a very important topic. So um, and I think it's all, you know, it has to do with this as well. So yeah, no, definitely interest rates to profit. And I think that this is becoming sort of an, a consensus now amongst the heterodox. Um, so the next next person if, with the hands wait, up. Wait, Marcia is there or will he give the word to Ilan Dogus? Aguilar, 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 Aguilar. Aguilar. Aguilar Ponce, please. Yes, thank you. Gracias, perdón. Este, thank you very much. Thank you very much also for your, uh, well, for your presentation. It was very clear, actually. Uh, my question for you was, well, I kind of wrote it down in the chat, but I want to be brief about it. I think that I can agree with, with the, to the best of my knowledge, at least, uh, with this, uh, with everything that you said today. However, my question, just to keep it brief, is, for example, in the case of developing countries such as Latin America, you know, here in Mexico and other Latin American countries, when we have no leverage, no political leverage whatsoever, uh, and with all this uh, foreign pressure that we are looking at right now, I mean, it's even obvious, it's even more obvious uh, in this situation uh, during this time. How can a developing country, such as a Latin American country, take control of their own policies or of our own policies to make a change to this kind of mainstream idea? And this, well, everything that you said about today, everything that you said today, how can a developing country take control of their own institutions? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I fully admit that, well, I mean, the same question, you know applies to developed economies. How can the heterodox community take control of a policy? You know, I mean, we are also uh, victims, if you want, or powerless regarding uh, mainstream policies. So I think that we share this very uh, sense, the, the, this, the same sense of, of being powerless, of being powerless. Um, and uh, which goes to what I was telling uh, Professor Levy, whether we can, you know, I'm a big advocate of these uh, financial regulations, but can we, can we impose them? You know, if I'm going to be honest, I have to say no. Uh, does that mean that you have to give up on your ideas? Uh, no, uh, you know, because as you know, the next person uh, I've had this discussion with uh, Ilan Dogus for many years now on the ideas, our ideas creeping into the mainstream. Um, they don't acknowledge us, but you know, there was a time 20 years ago when you know we were called fringe. And now, you know, a lot look at what's happened to MMT. Certainly not fringe, it's New York Times and it's, you know. So there is some progress there. I think there's some progress there. And I think that, uh, you know, the fact that uh, we, with Mario Secareccia, we were part of a group advocating for a dual mandate. Not a huge fan of dual mandate, but we met with the Bank of Canada and we pushed and we argued. And, you know, they came up with something close to a dual mandate. So there is way of organizing and, I think you have to be sort of um, really obnoxious about it. You just have to go into people's 
faces and, and certainly trying to find uh, common ground with, with the dissenters in neoclassical theory. I think that there's, you know, I mean, 20 years ago, Stiglitz was not writing with post-Keynesians and now he is. Um, so, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, the sense of being powerless in front of neoclassical theory is policy is a universal, um, universal feeling. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Luis Philippe, I think we leave we the... Can, we can give you the word to Ilan Douglas, no? Douglas, yes. Yes. Yeah, he had his hand up yesterday as well. Um, and I don't know if Ilan is there. Yeah. Ilan, are you here? Eh, ¿Hay alguien que quiera hacer una pregunta okay. adicional? Ahí está Ilian. Ahí, ah. ahí está. Yeah. Gracias. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me properly. Yes, 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 of course. Yeah. I have just two small questions. One, I am a bit puzzled. We say interest rates uh, are exaggerated uh, by mainstream understanding and investment decisions are not so much sensitive to interest rate changes. Then we say increasing interest rates can damage the economy. And then uh, isn't it con inconsistent? Uh, maybe you assume that small uh, enterprises and the firms with uh, uh, balance sheet uh, can be harmed by a sharp increase in uh, interest rates. Uh, could you please elaborate a bit more? Secondly, can't we conceive the interest rate as a tax in terms of Kaleski say, for example, in case of higher uh, tax rates, firms try to make more profits to achieve the uh, profit level uh, after the <clears throat> uh, tax. Then can, can't we just apply the same logic to the interest rates if the interest is higher then firms can make more investment uh, expenditures to achieve the uh, profit level after tax and interest and so on. Thanks. Yeah. So regarding the first, um, no, what I said is um, that investment may not respond to incremental changes in interest rates. But uh, if you push those interest rates to 10%, yeah, they're gonna have an impact. So that's why I called monetary policy a blunt instrument. For me, um, and I didn't get into it, but it's a good opportunity to explain. For me, investment decisions depend on expectations of aggregate demand and whether those expectations, whether, whether expectations in the growth of aggregate demand and whether these are seen as being permanent or temporary. If aggregate demand growth is expected to be temporary, it won't have much of an impact on investment. Investment firms have to be sure that uh, their investment, which is a permanent increase in their capacity to produce, is met by a permanent increase uh, in the ability to absorb that extra output. Um, and I think that if you want to be blunt, I think you can argue that uh, investment depends on a discrepancy between expected profitability, which is what I was saying, and relative to the interest rate. But I think that these two are causal, that as interest rates go up a little bit, it may not have an impact right away on expected profitability, but eventually it will. And that uh, it becomes no longer, uh, no longer, um, tenable to invest. So if you look at the current situation where interest rates are zero, it means that expected profitability is actually less than zero. It's just not worth um, investing. It's not worth uh, uh, committing to a permanent increase, right? I mean, this, you know, this is the whole, you know, uh, debate, right? I mean, you're not going to add, you're not going to build a new factory to leave it, uh, to leave it empty. So you're going to build a new factory thinking that whatever you extra you produce is going to be absorbed. And that's the sort of expected profitability, whatever you want to use as a proxy. 
expectations of growth of effective demand in a Keynesian uh, language. Uh, second, um, I think that you essentially described Minsky, right? As these interest rates go up and companies want to make more and more uh, profit, they're going to become, they're going to adopt riskier and riskier uh, projects. And, you know, this is how certainly I, I read it. I, I don't know if that's how you meant it. Um, perhaps where Eli is, he wants to ask something further, or we proceed there are two other questions. Luis Philippe, Mar I already Mar sent you one question in, in the chat for you. Ah, thank you. Let me look. For Mercy, and there is another one from Gabriel Dete. Si no estoy mal. Yes, yes, yes. I don't know if, if Gabriel wants to speak. Well, uh, so let me ask, uh, answer the yeah. Mafia's question. Yes, so I kind of alluded to that, right? There's, um, there's a couple of people who are precisely uh, writing on that uh, topic itself, which is the influence of interest rates on exchange rates and distribution. And, you know, um, I'm trying to pull up the uh, table of contact and that's in the gender book. And um, the, um, uh, who are they? I mean, give me a second, give me a second. Um, uh, it's by Clara Zanen Breck, Brank and Patricia Kuto, both from the uh, New School. And they're writing on interest rates, exchange rates, uh, development, income distribution, and gender. That's a mouthful. But that's exactly what they're uh, working on, Marcia. And, uh, and you're right. There's, there's something there that needs to be explored specifically or especially in the context of, uh, of Latin America. Thank you. For okay. Let me send you another one, Ms. Philippe. Uh... OK. Give me a second. Yes. Oh. <coughs> oh, okay. Um, uh, well, you know, it depends on what you mean by uh, if that rule does not work, it can be followed by a Friedman rule. For example, the fact my interesting point of rule is I don't know if I know. Well, I see it sort of a you know, um, as mechanical, you know, in the sense that, um, oh, what's the word? He describes it as a, uh, 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 sort of, you know, the reaction itself is very mechanical. Um, uh, you know, you have inflation, you raise rates, uh, you, you know, so that's how I meant very mechanical. Now it's not the same way as mechanical in the sense of Friedman, 3% rule on money supply growth. Um, but I certainly see sort of a, 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 the Taylor rule as being, you know, I mean, every, all rules in a way uh, are, are mechanical in one way or the other. And I certainly see that as being, you know, inflation goes up, you raise rates. Okay. okay. Uh, can perhaps, I make I make a last question. I don't think there is any hand up, which is very popular today. I may say, in terms of interest rate and stagflation, we shall yeah. remember that stagf all the interest rate policy started in the seventy, in the context of stagflation. What you would think about that? Because in Mexico, I think we have raised two points, the interest rate in the fear that stagflation would come and in the fear that the US will, ri will raise their interest rate. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's what's, but that is what's happening now. Now with the, with the Russian oil crisis, I'm not sure it's a crisis yet, but it may become a crisis with the increase in the oil of price, the price of oil. Um, 
with inflation on the rise, uh, central banks will react by raising interest rates. And I think they'll be rather aggressive about it. And um, I think you're, we may be facing down the barrel of a 1970s type of situation. The, the, the challenge, don't forget in 1970, the, the interest rate went up to 20% in Canada, right? So I think that they're not gonna go that route, um, but I think they're gonna be aggressive enough in their, in their pursuit the challenge for post Keynesians, and I'm uh, announcing that next Thursday, I'm giving a talk on the progressive response to stagflation. Um, you know, the challenge for us is to figure out, well, which is what I've said towards the, in the last two days, what are you trying to solve? And are there other means than, than central banks? We have given central banks so much power over inflation that we've sort of created this beast um, that, by the way, everyone accepts, right? Everyone, if you go down the street and you ask people, they're all gonna say, oh, the central bank must raise interest rate. It sort of has become embedded in our, in our collective consciousness. But we have, to, as progressives, we have to explore other ways um, of, uh, of looking at uh, the possibility of stagflation, other policies. We have to. Otherwise, if we leave it to the mainstream, you know, we're, we might end up having inf uh, interest rates of 10%. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. Thank you very <laughs> much, everyone. No, we want to thank oh. you. Yes, and I hope you. to see you in person in November. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I so. would love to see you guys. And we hope that uh, this... I think these key lectures have been very good, very, everyone understood them, complex things said in simple ways. This is good for our students. Uh,